Well, hello, everybody. Oh, I got my Detroit Dugpa hat on. I don't need that. Yeah, so here I am. John Barnwell here in the city of Detroit, the Straits, Detroit. And I'm here with my buddy, Robert Allen Pittman. And uh, he's over in the UK, in England, actually. He would, he would take umbrage in just referring to it as UK. Yeah, that's that's pretty nasty stuff. That UK business. We'll he's, talk about that. Yeah. Yeah, he's in the British realm. Yeah, <clears throat> that's right. And so uh, <laughs> we, we're here today, and you know, I I asked Robert Allen, "Well, what do you want to do?" And he, he brought up this subject, and I thought, okay, but it's quite a, a <clears throat> huge topic, and it's it's extremely important uh, to understand Rudolf Steiner's work. One of the primary sources, of course, is the mission of the individual folk souls in, in relation to Teutonic mythology, and that was a cycle of eleven lectures <laughs> given in, given in Christiana, which we now call Oslo, uh, back in nineteen ten. But uh, this is uh, important when you when you realize that this is one of the few lecture cycles that Rudolf Steiner contributed a preface. Okay, so that says okay, this must be something he thought was important, just like uh, the leadership of mankind that uh, four lecture series. That's really important to to understand to approach this material. He actually took the lectures and rewrote them, and put them out in a book form. So there's certain things that Rudolf Steiner highlights in his body of work, which is some 36 and a half feet of shelf space. So it it kind of begs uh, the question: uh, Is gee, I wonder if that's an important one? And the answer is yes, because if you don't understand uh, the contents of this book, it's really difficult to grasp his relationship to the mysteries of time. And uh, a little humorous aside here, I got it for $6.95 back in the mid-70s, marked down from eight ninety five, dollars And uh, so that's kind of funny, the way things go. But... <laughs> In, in dipping into that lecture cycle, there's such a, a, a wide cascade, really, of uh, subjects, and it's dealt with in a very concentrated form. So what we're going to do is try to address some leading concepts that will give us kind of a point of entry into this. And so I'm happy to be here with Robert Allen Pittman, the the uh, Geez, uh, what can I say? He's like this amazing uh, martial arts instructor and physical discipline instructor and author and and like myself has spent a great deal of time trying to discern uh, Rudolf Steiner's work. And so considering that 60, uh, 6,786 or so lectures and 50 books and articles, that's a daunting task. So. We're just here trying to help clear the air a little bit. So, how you doing there, Robert? Well, I think I'm I'm okay. It's uh, <clears throat> it's a cold day, three three degrees above freezing here in in Warrington, and uh, <clears throat> I've been thinking about this this subject because I'm at present involved in a a fairly daunting task, which is to create a map of uh, wisdom traditions around the world. So, you know, to be able to to get that into a manageable format is uh, is part of what I'm dealing with. And because it's a global wisdom archive, I have to consider culture and which cultures produced which wisdom streams and uh, and also how the earth itself in its interaction with the human being creates different kinds of wisdom with different applications. Um, my easiest example of that is uh, <clears throat> the wine tradition. 
you only find certain grapes on certain hillsides because of the geographic conditions, the moisture, the fertility of the soil, the sun, the length of the growing season and all that. So people go to great pains to to find certain vintages of grape because they're largely formed or we could say their flavor is instigated by the land they're on. And so there was a, a meeting between the Australians years ago, the Australian Medical Association and the Medical Associ Association of Iran. And uh, Australia had a technology that Iran wanted and they couldn't decide on a price. And finally, one of the Australians said, wait a minute, if you don't have any technology, maybe you've got some cultural aspect that we would like to, to use or to have. And it turned out that it was the recipe for Shiraz. And so what happened is the uh, Australians traded medical tech for Shiraz recipes. And I think they actually sent some Persian vines to Australia. At any, at any rate, my point is, that's why the Australian Shiraz is so good. Uh, there was an agreement, there was a relationship, and there was an appreciation of a cultural aspect that actually turned out to be more valuable than tech to the people involved. So there the humanities and the technologies uh, shook hands and everybody went home relatively happy. And so to me, that's an example of how, how culture works. Okay, John, let's go from that. Well, viticulture, yes. You can't uh, underestimate the significance of viticulture or wine in the development of the, the consciousness of the ego. And by ego, I'm making reference to, of course, I am the I am that's referred to in scriptures and not anything on, in the Freudian sense. And so when we look at that and you say, well, why is that? Well, it has to do with the fact of, of the Rudolf Steiner mentioning that through uh, taking wine, what it did was it helped to separate off the, the tribal group consciousness and bring one into a more uh, of an earthly focus of consciousness. And so uh, Ed brings up an interesting subject because I was thinking it'd be good to lead off with, with something out of the uh, preface of the mission of folk souls and to give you a uh, kind of a flavor of the depth of the subject. And Rudolf Steiner says on February 8th, uh, the ordinary scientific study of anthropology, ethnology, or even history cannot provide a sufficient foundation for a true psychology of the various folk characters. With the knowledge provided by the science, we cannot penetrate any further just as by means of anatomy and physiology, we cannot arrive at the knowledge of the inner psychic life of man if we wish to learn the inward life of an individual human being, we must pass from the body to the soul. And if we desire to gain real knowledge of the characters of the various peoples, we must penetrate to the soul and spirit in them. This soul and spirit is, however, not a mere cooperation of the several human souls in that people, but it is one that is higher than these. Modern science is not accustomed to study this higher soul and spirit. Before its form, it is paradoxical to speak of folk souls as real beings in the same way as we speak of the real thought, feeling, and will of individual human beings. It is also paradoxical before this form to connect the development of the peoples on earth with the forces of the heavenly bodies in space, end quote. So there you have it. You just, uh, he's taken the whole uh, kind of history of, of comparative studies in the West and just said, nice try. Because 
because they don't have the mysteries of time to unlock it, they just uh, will, like he makes reference to, well, if this particular deity is wearing a uniform and this other one over in this other country is wearing a uniform too, then they equate them. And that it's, it's not anything even close to uh, the factual relationship to the subject. Because he talks about the history of the development of consciousness and how radically different the old Indian Stone Age culture is from even the, the following culture in the cycle of 2,160 years of the Persians. And, and then after that, going into the Egypto-Chaldean period, and then after that, into the Greco Roman period, that that these are our transitions in consciousness, and there's other complexities involved, such as, for example, with the Northern Europeans who came into a, a an objective relationship with the I am principle uh, quite early on, but through the experience of the sentient soul. Whereas in old India, they developed a very highly specialized form of esoteric understanding culminating on Advaita Vedanta and, and Kashmiri Shaivism and, and schools of thought like that that did not have a developed doctrine of the self beyond the subjective realm. So there's a very big difference between the, the uh, Northern European uh, mysteries that were established by Scythianos to be able to perceive the the approach of the I am principle as it would be referred to down in uh, the Holy Land, but yet this is something that was coming through the agency of the angelical hierarchies as expressed in their deiforms uh, uh, for that time, so that you have Odin in the archangelic realm, and then you have uh, Thor as, as a servant of that principle in the angelic realm. But yet, Rita Steiner says that these are beings that should have elevated higher, but out of sacrifice remained in a lower stage that they could have gone beyond that. So that, that uh, Thor could have been an archangel and uh, Odin could have moved on into the realm of the archives so that you have this like complexity, level of complexity that's not easy for people to grasp. And so I I wanted to share that kind of early on to, to kind of pull in our calipers a little bit because there's so many areas which can this can get confused, so I'll, uh, primarily with the topic of when people talk about groups of people, they get into that whole race thing, which is like, as far as we're concerned, is out the window since Atlantis, that it has more to do with the development on a cultural level. Yeah. And what I wanted to say was um, <clears throat> uh, a good premise for anyone coming in from the periphery is we know that human thinking changes over time because we see it reflected in the languages of different cultures and in different epochs. So there are, there are ways of thinking. Uh, a simple example is in poetry. Uh, at one time, uh, poets talked about the eye of the heart, being able to see with your heart. But after the harp was invented, they started talking about the strings of the heart. And so what we find is that the way we conceive of our feelings alters as uh, our perception of things around us alter. And that includes the effect of technology or art on us so that we can conceive of new things. So I wanted to throw out first, John, that, that people have thought quite differently at different times, and this has given them various gifts and curses all along in all cultures. And uh, this relates to why the Egyptians had a technology that worked for them that likely does not work for us. Uh, although we can still get some of the effects using their principles, neither we nor the earth is the same as it was in the times of ancient Egypt. 
So I wanted to bring that up because I think people have this idea that everything is as it's always been, and they evaluate race, culture, uh, technology, archaeology as though people have never been through any kind of a change and that the earth has always worked as we see it working now. And this is a sort of uh, simplified way of leveling the playing field so that we can pretend to understand everything from our present perspective. And in actuality, it's highly dangerous because it was like um, Gurdjieff said to some people when they said, isn't your teaching Jesus's teaching? And he said very flatly, I don't know, I was not there at the time. And so I think this is a, a really important perspective to, to have about cultures is that how we perceive them now and how they were perce perceived in their own time can be quite different. Moreover, the instrument or the senses the people themselves had of perceiving these things were quite different. Um, i.e. the old wine dark sea that seemed to have disappeared once we developed the ability to to see purple. Um, so I wanted to bring up this idea that people change, the earth changes, and also the conception of both of those things changes over time. So it's kind of tough because uh, we don't always have the John Barnwell book of mandalas to show us the numeric oscillations of these changes to make sense out of it. So for now, I realize for people listening to this, it may sound a bit like we're playing baseball and moving the bases as soon as the, ba the ball is hit. But it's not quite that bad, but it's a bit like that. Well, that's that's the the real the puzzle factor, you know, and that's why it really is a quest. And, and there are even times at which uh, Rudolf Steiner says, well, there, yeah, but there aren't really any any abstract concepts that can convey, convey correctly what I'm getting at. And you go, I mean, it's like, what does that mean? You see, so you have to be able to understand, for, for example, in, uh, I believe it's lecture four in, in the, the book I was just making reference to, The Mission of Folk Souls, where he starts talking about the archangels, which are two stages beyond humanity. And he says that all these thoughts that we have, and I'm just, of course, paraphrasing, but all these thoughts that we have regarding the world and, and all this, they, they don't perceive that. And, and again, that what they are able to perceive, they're, the, they're also called the fire spirits. And so you could see that there's, they went through their human equivalent stage on Old Sun. So their relationship is to that world of, of the combination of light and warmth. And so they're starving from current mankind's uh, minuscule contributions to the realms of light and warmth, you see. So what you need to do is is to to develop the wonder and awe and reverence to give something as an offering to that realm. And where one of them want to communicate with this realm, Rita Steiner says he would do it through the agency of an angel because an angel is closer to our realm and can work within the realm of ideas. And so when you go back and you look at, like, say, a Joan of Arc, okay, she's a great example because basically what the story is about her is that she was receiving messages from, Ar from Archangel Michael and Archangel Gabriel. And it was destined at the time for a separation of the English folk soul from the French folk soul. But you see that even though she's reporting that she's receiving communications from these beings, it's through the agency of an angelic sacrificing itself up to serve as uh, a messenger. And Rudolf Steiner says in the Bible that whenever they like they say somebody's a messenger, it has to do with that's what angel means. It's messenger. And so when he gets into start talking about, for example, John the Baptist and the idea of him being a messenger, it's that there's this involvement of the realm of the angels, of the beings that are one stage beyond 
mankind. But at certain key points, there is a conjoining of, of levels of being in, to be able to interact with our realm. And it's like, I mean, just to think that thought for an afternoon is, can change your whole life. Yeah, there's, uh, there's something I wanted to interject, and that is uh, the Greek word angel means messenger. So it doesn't necessarily mean a supernatural being, but it means a being that's bearing a message. So a lot of things can be angels in the general sense, but if it's applied to a, a being that's bearing a message or a kind of intelligence that's higher than ours, then it begins to move into a, a supernatural or preternatural realm. And so my, my feeling about angels is, I know people that are smarter than me, so therefore I believe there are also beings that are superior to me in other dimensions. And so I step into it that way. And then if there are these other beings, and since our sense perception operates in a very, very narrow scale of the spectrum, we have to allow a lot of other things that we cannot sense to actually exist. And so I want to throw that out as a sort of rational caveat for people to get an orientation. You know, we see seven colors and we have however many senses you want to calibrate. Steiner says 12, the U.S. military says 23, and most of us are only taught five, which narrows the window considerably and keeps us fairly marketable. Um, but in that, uh, in that idea of, of having a, a huge range of life and reality that's outside our senses uh, that exists on other wavelengths, a lot of people are very fond of saying, well, we're in a 3G world or a 4G or 5G, or we're, we're in a high vibe or a low vibe or a medium vibe. All these different ways of describing things of realities and of layers are, are people's attempt to convey that there's worlds within worlds and that there are frequencies well beyond our senses that actually are occupied by beings. So I wanted to kind of get that in as a, a general wedge for people's thinking to know what we're, what we're dealing with when we talk about an angel. We're talking about something that can come into our reality and then can also disappear from our reality. We can sense it, feel it, it can communicate to us. In short, we can get an idea. Since after all, an angel is a messenger, we get an idea. Where does this idea come from? And you could say, it's something someone told you. What interests me is when you have ideas that come into your head that are not from anywhere you can trace. That's what interests me. This is what you see in great art. And this is what you see with scientists and people who are inspired. So these things interest me because these are more or less the fingerprints of angels of various kinds. And uh, in the course above them are, are archai. And rather than go into the whole cosmography, John, I just wanted to say that an archai is a sort of a large scale primal force and it's a cosmic force. And there's a tendency in our education to feel like the earth is a bubble and people live on this tiny green membrane around the, the earth and, and spend their histories killing each other. When in reality, these beings in this tiny green membrane around our blue marble that's floating in space, they're, they're susceptible to different forms of cosmic radiation and light that penetrate the earth at different angles and wrap around it, much like a corkscrew. And of course, we know the whole solar system is more or less spiraling through space. But I want people to have the idea that the earth not only does the sun shine on it, but a multitude of star patterns and varying frequencies and colors of light and tone bathe the earth and they shift through the seasons. So the earth is sort of taking this continual cosmic 
dance in in a pulsation in repetitions and the people on the earth uh, also participate in this we participate in the springtime and in the seasons and in the taste of the plants that come from the earth um, and so there's this whole uh, punctuated relatively rhythmical dance of lights and colors and rays that surround the earth that all live, life thrives on and those forces if you can think of them as different colors coming through a stained glass window onto your skin those forces create changes on the surface and they change they create changes on the surface of your skin this is why light therapy works but they also create changes on the skin of the earth and they affect the way people think and move digest metabolize catabolize uh, meditate and so because different regions are susceptible to different kinds of forces for instance a valley tends to be a bit like a radar dish and it tends to receive a lot of energy that ricochets around in the basin and develop a lot of heat so there are valley cultures that develop certain concepts and ideas and foods and there are also high mountain cultures that do something quite different and they, as a result, develop a different kind of tool making and a different kind of language and a different kind of perception. So what I wanted to, to talk about as far as the gifts of culture are that landforms are affected by cosmic forces and the people that live on those landforms and interact with them are also mediums between the cosmic forces and the land forces and this morphs them into a certain disposition and we call that a culture now i want to separate that from race because people are going to say oh well you're saying that some races do this and some races do that well that's a yes no and i'll tell you why before columbus came to america along the rivers particularly on the east coast there had already been inundations literally uh, whole armies that had come from wales with prince maddock around 900 there were already irish there were already aztecs and mayans up from south america there were already cherokee in the southeast regions and up and down the eastern seaboard of the united states and they were already in organized agricultural farming and hunting communities, all of these different races. And they settled together, get this, Irish, Welsh, Black, and Indian tribes. They were all living and commingling. This is America before Columbus. They were already commingling along all the rivers. Now, what made it a culture was that they were living together along the rivers in the same environment, developing a shareable language and a full exchange. They were, we would call it the Eastern Seaboard River culture of North America. And they existed before Columbus. And they were already, get this, multiracial, but they were already evolving into a single culture. So I wanted to get that out of the canon because I wanted people to have a sense of how when you live together on the same land, whatever race you are, because of the land, you become a culture. Okay, sermonette over, John, take it away. Yeah, Prince Maddox. Yeah, I got. I have a book on him uh, around here somewhere. Yeah, there's him and there's, there's, uh, what uh, Sir Hen Henry Sinclair? I mean, you, you go to to uh, the stories of Glooscap in in the uh, up in Canada and Nova Scotia and all that. That the the legendary accounts by the Indians they talk about this guy. They called him Glooscap, and he came from over the sea and came over there and taught him certain things, you know. And if but yet if you go back 
uh, to Scotland, and and you and you look at the cathedral on his lands, which is like the the very last, really, of the Gothic. And he, the Sinclairs are the the ancestral heads of of Freemasonry in Scotland, by the way. Yeah. But yeah. in in the carvings in this cathedral, that that they have. Uh, species of plants that are only to be found in North America. Likewise, there's a, a, a cathedral that uh, predates that one in, in Normandy that was made by a distant relative of mine that has, you know, marmosets. And marmosets are only to be found in uh, the Western world in, in South America, you know? So it's like, where in the world did they, they learn how to draw a marmoset, you know? So the world is far more cosmopolitan than people recognize. And they're starting to discover some of this through uh, working through the human genome. But that's been very misleading uh, over the years of its development because of the uh, uneven sample size uh, that that's found in the studies. Like for example, in Ukraine, there isn't available uh, a large number of, of sample size uh, relative to other cultures or, or going into, into Asia in certain areas. So, and that can be misleading because we're really not talking about, although there's the modification of, of the, the genetics that can happen through environmental conditions. Rudolf Steiner said you have to ref, restrain from thinking that the mud, that with the tracks of the wagon, that the that the mud's the cause of the tracks, you know. So it's like, yeah, it's, that's uh, that's true, John. And what I'd like to the the analogy I like about DNA is uh, <coughs> DNA is a structure, and what people don't realize when they hear this. They, they think of DNA, and this is also involved in how the information is presented to us, which is, of course, part of the materialistic science propaganda campaign that this is it. They're always looking for the substance that is it. And then they find there's something a little smaller than the atom, or there's something a little different than they thought. They're continually splitting hairs and never getting anywhere, but it creates a, an army of PhDs that can do the same. So. This idea that um, the DNA is the source, it's like mistaking the milk for the milk carton. <laughs> if you have a milk carton, you can't drink it. You put the milk in the milk carton. You can recognize that there is milk in there because of the carton, but you can also empty it and just have an empty hull. Now, DNA is a structure, so it doesn't explain its content and right now I am pretty interested in the recent data that indicates DNA is fiber optic, because that would indicate it can transfer light photons at varying frequencies and colors. And I find that interesting because we know light is already intelligent from, from the slot experiment and it can know when it's being watched and not watched. So for me, if, if this present idea that is evolving that the DNA is fiber optic, then we're really interested in what's passing through the DNA, not, not in the DNA itself. And what's interesting is it looks like we can rearrange certain DNA and it won't do what we thought. For instance, the structure that gives you eye color, when they change its position in the DNA string, it may not relate to eye color at all anymore. So it may do something else. It's very tricky. So that also, I think, is important to hold up to uh, the, the people who want to worship the DNA as the, as the source of what's streaming into their being and into the planet. Um, the other thing uh, about DNA is the junk DNA, so-called, is a huge mass of data and information that's, that has been sidelined as not relevant. So we're actually only being given a tiny sample of what DNA is. And of course, the reason they're doing this is not just scientific convenience. 
It's because the research is funded by the military and they want to find out how to make the super soldier or the super disease. So they, they're trying to find the Archimedes lever. They're trying to find the points of weakness and strength in the DNA for manipulation. And then what they hope to do is patent this process so they can make money on the process as well as on the weapon. But that leaves, of course, huge amounts of data and huge amounts of understanding about what DNA is uh, that fall outside the realm of all of these military industrial experiments. Uh, and we'll take up CERN later. Anyway, go ahead. Yes, it's uh, it's as if like somebody thought that the movies that they're watching on their TV set were uh, being generated spontaneously inside their antenna, you know. <laughs> and it's it's as if the uh, antenna's thinking the movies, and wh whereas it's just a conduit, it's a trans. Yeah. Uh, transmission receiver and uh, and they know actually very little about it, but there are certain things about it that are coming to be discovered. Uh, and at this point, uh, the, but the few reliable things it has to do with information regarding migrations and gender. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's basically. Uh, about as reliable as you can get all this other work. They they have done some things to figure out that there's relationship between certain gene structures and certain uh, so-called inherited illnesses, and, but they're they're really no not good at using like CRISPR to insert anything. Although they they have had a certain amount of success with removing things, but it it again there's a, a unintended variation that results because you look at it and the DNA is yet another spiral form structure like our solar yes, system. Yes, yeah, yeah. And the big, the big thing is there's something intelligent passing through the DNA and they're not going to be able to uh, grab that cat by the tail because yeah. it, it, it's intelligent and it has a, a will of its own connected to higher cosmic wills. There's your angels and archangels and such. And they did find that they could um, create some mutations in the D through DNA manipulation. Uh, the scientists found this out. What was interesting is if they left the, if the plant alone, it would revert back to its regular form in one or two generations very quickly as though whatever the DNA, DNA was or whatever was passing through the DNA, it had a memory and it had an agenda. And so it's interesting when you can go in and fiddle with something and force it to change and then you leave it alone and it goes back to its original form. That indicates there's another source for maintaining structure that has that is not to do with the DNA per se. So. There's a lot of things with it that, that are not known, but the way it's presented, John, is what's interesting to me because in all of these pseudoscientific uh, presentations on the web, the words perhaps and may and probably are always the dominating words. And you're being steered to conceive of the DNA as doing certain things. When in reality, there's very little certainty in any of the research. And I think it would be good for, you know, you could look at anything and look for the words maybe, perhaps, and sometimes, and see how many times that appears. Because that is not uh, a word that will come up from empirical data. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that's a, boy, if, talk about dry humor. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, because see, and Rudolf Steiner is very clear about that, and he, it's it's frustrating because he says you shouldn't disparage the actual factual information that that modern science is accumulating. It, that's not the problem. The problem is is when they try to figure out what that means, 
and and what's the significance of of that finding that yeah. they that they uh they go off the rails because well assignment of values you see people forget that science is a method of inquiry it's a way of looking at the data and cross-referencing it and and doing live experiments with with uh, bl you know double blind experiments to figure out what is reproducible so it's very limited and the scientific method really it it only became the be all from the 19th century on and when when uh, a person expects an animal, a plant, or a chemical substance to behave consistently when it is in prison in the lab, they're essentially sticking the dog in a corner and poking it with a stick. They don't realize that they're dealing, even if they're dealing with so-called inanimate matter, they're dealing with something that has a disposition and an intelligence because something has produced this substance they're experimenting on. And when people say to me, well, well, Alan, blah, blah, blah. And if uh, this was true, it would prove in the lab, I would, I have to say to them, okay, let me put it this way. If you want consistent lab result, results, I only have one question for you. Will your friends help you move the second time if it's in the same week? <laughs> and they say, what do you mean? And I'll say, okay, look, I'm gonna move my house, right? I got all my furniture and books, God help me, I got books, so your back's gonna pay for that. Okay, and my friends come in I got great friends and they say, we'll help you move, Alan. I say, great, I'll bring the pizza and the beer. And they all show up on Saturday, right? And they help me move like an Amish barn raising. You know, you all get together, unified will, and you move the whole thing from A to Z. And then it's all done. Okay. And you thank your friends and you hand out the beers and the pizza and you say, God, I'm glad that's over. Ain't moving a bitch. And everyone says, yeah, so glad I got friends. Okay. That worked, all right. Now, one week later, you're gonna call up the same friends again and you're gonna say, hey, I gotta move again. Do you think they're gonna show up? <laughs> okay, because what you're doing is you're asking them for a favor. You're asking them for their energy, their time and their awareness in the same way, again, in, an, in a short amount of time that they're not up to and so even though they're your friends they're going to say no now that's the way i feel about matter in the laboratory you're going to stick it in this is cern too you're going to stick your particle you're going to stick your plant you're going to stick your animal in a corner call it what you will it's always controlled conditions now we have another word for that in english which is prison so you're going to put it in controlled conditions, right? And you're going to needle it and you're going to change temperatures. You're going to mess with it. You're going to inject it, whatever scientific thing you're going to do. And you're going to see if it reacts the same way every time. And if it doesn't, you're going to make up certain ideas about it. So for me, the scientific method is a very limited system of inquiry particularly if you're working with things that are sentient, with things that can feel. And so I have to throw that out so people realize that sometimes things don't do what you want because they have other ideas. And if it's a living universe, if it's an intelligent universe, and you don't approach it like it's intelligent, well, you tell me, how do you feel if people approach you like you're not intelligent? Well, you get kind of pissed off and resistive. Sometimes you get downright hatey, right? You get downright hateful. So, you know, uh, Steiner said, when the laboratory bench becomes an altar, men will begin to understand science. In other words, when you begin to approach everything that's created as being alive and intelligent and sensing, 
you realize that every single thing, even on a subatomic level, is feeling your presence. And therefore, you have to be your best to even begin the approach to asking the question. But right now, you know, we're still living in a world where we torture animals to make a point. So vivisection continues for the cosmetic industry. Uh, torture goes on on a military level on human beings. And uh, we don't believe matter is intelligent. So we put it in prison and needle it and sub subject it to, to neutrino bombardment and all that as though it's not intelligent. And it's about time for people to wake up and realize the whole thing is intelligent. Everything is intelligent. And so to get across that idea to people, they'll say, well, whose help are you going to have when you pray? And I'll say, well, I'll talk it over with my subatomic playmates. <laughs> you know, they're my friends, but I respect them because they can also do things that I don't like. So there's this whole thing about the intelligent universe that figures into what we're talking about with the angels and the archai on a very giant, large scale cosmic level. But then, you know, with your dog, with your pet fish, you know, with the bird that flies outside your window or with your own body, which is basically the, the equivalent of a separate animal from yourself that you have to treat and nurture and maintain and train um, in the same way that you would uh, an animal uh, that you have in your possession. You know, the body's like a temporary dog you have till you, till you shake it off and get a new one. Anyway, well, yeah. Go ahead, John. Uh, St. Francis is uh, brother donkey, you know, and how he referred to his physical vehicle. Yeah, and the donkey, you know, I have a friend from Jordan, and he's a boxing buddy, and he he was showing me how his dad taught him to, to box while moving backwards, which is not a very typical strategy, and he had beautiful technique. At any rate, we were talking about the animal kingdom one day. This was when I was living in Brittany, France, and he said, you know what my favorite animal is? And I said, what? He said, my favorite animal is the little donkey, the burro. And I said, why? And he said, I want to tell you a story. He said, when I was in the high mountains, I was so exhausted that I couldn't hold my head up. And uh, I was out of food. And I, was, and I had to get home. And so my friend loaned me this donkey that knew the way. And he said, I got on the back of that little donkey with a blanket. And he said, I fell asleep. And that donkey walked through the most dangerous parts of the ridges along the mountains at high altitude on its own without a sound and took him home. And he fell asleep on its back, but he was safe. And that little donkey knew the way home. So as a model of navigation, stability, comfort, life-saving, uh, fantastic character, noble, consistent, loyal. He said there was nothing better than a donkey. I thought it was an incredibly touching story. And he felt so close to this animal because he knew it had saved his life. And it was a, a creature that could entirely be depended upon. <laughs> There's your donkey story. Your turn, yeah. John. Yeah, I have some donkey stories by myself, but I, I don't know if we're, I'll just share one. Uh, you know, when I was at riding camp, they had a donkey there. Man, could that thing make some noise. I read mean, yeah. geez. <laughs> they Any, do that. Yeah, they do that. Uh, but, uh, yes, yeah, so to get, Looking at this more closely and, and in reference to groups of people, Rudolf Steiner is very clear as, as his indications regarding folk souls and the, the temperament of the folk souls based upon an environment. So it's something that I've discussed on previous episodes uh, with, with other of my friends. And it, gets into, and I can characterize it here for because some of the people here 
probably haven't seen those, and I have so many, I don't know how they would find them. I couldn't. Mm -hmm. But in any regards, so you you go back to the the Roman folk soul, and he says that as a the temperament uh, pertaining to the element of air, whereas France is water, and the British Isles is earth, and then the element of warmth has to do with the Central and Northern European. And so you get into, we've discussed it now that I recall, I yeah. did get into some mention of this because you have the uh, Melusina that we discussed before, the the water sprite. Or yeah, she's quite something. The Undine that is, is equated well, with Mel, the Mel, beginning. Melusina, it, she is in essence the Starbucks logo. Yeah. She's the, she's the twin tail mermaid. Yeah, but she's uh, said to be the 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 bride of uh, the the beginner of their line of kingship, and so this is kind of an unusual thing. I'm like, oh, really? And uh, but you could see, I have, I didn't know we were going there, but I have some great uh, visual depictions of her uh, in the t in the tower, and so she's quite a remarkable uh, storyline. And you get into the U.S. Here we have the. Uh, Rudolf Steiner refers to that we have subnature as the basis for the American folk soul. But the key in understanding this, because he says what's necessary is for people to be able to come to a relationship to spiritual science and be able to raise up their aspirations so that they can work with what is now the, the zeitgeist or the time spirit of, of which... Uh, the Archangel Michael in 1879 in November uh, took over the cycle of the Archangelic periods, but Rudolf Steiner further said that he transcended that realm into the realm of the Archai as the time spirit, and he is the time spirit of the age in which we live, but that we have to be able to, to uh, direct our aspirations and development in a way to be able to access that realm of cosmic intelligence that is, has descended on Earth since the ninth century. And so that all sounds very complex, but basically what is necessary is for people to be able to take up the wonder, awe, and reverence as a path. And, and you know, somebody might be intimidated by by the complexity of the knowledge, but keep in mind that Rudolf Steiner says, if one works with the Lord's Prayer, the, the whole formula is in there for the transformation of yourself. And that if you just share uh, the Lord's Prayer in, in the right mood of soul, that you're doing development, even though you don't understand the nature of the development that you're going through, but yet that's the only prayer that was given to us by by Christ. And so it gives us the, the seed formation for our future development to help us be able to make the transition into the next period. Yeah, I think uh, that's, that's, of course, all true. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Neil Douglas Klotz, but he's a Sufi who did a, a direct and very beautiful translation of the Lord's Prayer in Aramaic. And as a Sufi, he gives talks about it uh, within the context of its cultural origins. And he's on Facebook and YouTube. But for someone jumping into the Lord's Prayer from the outset, if, they, if they're not coming in with the full penelope of anthroposophy, uh, Neil, Neil Douglas Klotz is a great start because he's really interested in the cultural richness of what the Aramaic meant at the time. And so it's a really nice uh, kickoff point if any of the listeners want to start putting it on. Well, Rudolf Steiner even makes the point. He says it's even more effective in Latin. So you could see by extension, it's even more effective at using the language the Lord used to create the prayers, yeah. Aramaic. Yeah, this is you know, this is another that, yeah, this that is a mantra whole other potency. Thing. You know, it's like this, yeah, this is again, this is the gift of culture. And before we wind up, um just to give a, a sense of where I came from, well, since a lot of my training was early on as a Plymouth Brethren minister. I'm very familiar with the Bible. I got very interested in theology and I was able to make contact with a man who 
wrote about the three, what he considered to be theologically the three predominant cultures. So he had a threefold model of cultural influence on the planet based on Noah's three sons. And he took all the extant archaeology and he backed it up into a threefold sequence. So what I got was that each culture, as it evolved, had particular gifts to give humanity. And so in order for them to have a gift, they also had to have a deficit. So specialization required them to have gifts and deficits. So early on in my, my theological study, I was reading the work of Arthur Custance. The interesting thing about Arthur Custance was he was a linguist and a physiologist. So he not only could translate Egyptian, Hebrew, and Greek, he understood the whole physiology of respiratory mechanics. And he was good at math, which is more than I can say for myself. But we had a lot of fantastic conversations about which cultures were the creative cultures and which cultures took the, the inventions of the other cultures and refined them, but invented nothing new, but actually took the, and, and refined and improved. And then other cultures that were absolutely not interested in technology, but as a result developed a technology of the mind. So all everything that was expressed as devices and machines in one culture was reflected back in in another culture as an inner process or what you could describe as primitive psychology in archetypal storytelling and song lines like with the aboriginals in Australia. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, my uh, well, my family's company were they were pioneers in CAD CAM, which is computer assisted design, computer assisted machinery, and you know for engineering for the automobile industry and all of that back in the heyday, back in the fifties and sixties. And my father, who founded the company, explained to me. He said, "Well, you know what we do is we will design something, and then then we send it to Germany and." They refine it, and then we we send it to Japan, and they make it smaller. <laughs> and so you it see, was, and that and that's that's a huge lesson in intercultural cooperation, but also in the gifts of each culture, what they can do. I mean, the Japanese show the the skill in miniaturization in the bonsai tree. They know how to create a perfectly scaled down version of a gigantic thing, how to culture it, how to develop it. Um, so there's incredible um, insight available if people will look at cultures as bearing gifts and not as though they're competing. They're at each, each one brings in a fantastic service in the, in the global garden, as it were. Well, yeah, that's that's the lesson of the three kings. The the, the on January six arrive at 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 the the Jesus baby, right? You know, so that he he told me this other story. He said a friend of his has a, had an engineering company and he wanted to have something done by the Japanese, and so he sent them a stack of metal, and he told them to that he wanted to see if they could drill this microscopic hole and he got it back and it was threaded <laughs> so not only did they drill that hole but they were able to thread it and this is back in the 60s so imagine where oh, yeah. things are today you know well, well gee, you know it's it's funny john what happens because not every culture is able to display its its full capacity for instance, yeah. the Egyptians had a steam pits, piston. And when someone asked the king, why don't you use the steam piston to open the gates? He said, uh, well, what would the slaves do? So there's also the fact that cultures, including this one, and maybe the, the present culture more than any other, has repressed technologies. Yeah. That's, a whole other, that's a whole other subject, particularly in regard to energy production. And they're repressed for economic reasons. Yes. So uh, that's absolutely the truth. Uh, so, well, we're running out of time here, but uh, I can't run out of subjects to talk to with this gentleman here. And it's it's wonderful. That's fun. 
yeah, it's a, it's very enjoyable, and we just how somehow managed to scratch the surface once again. And, Thank you, John. But I, I appreciate your coming here. And of course, I have two books. And this one, I still haven't got it reprinted yet, but it's 640 pages, The Arcana of the Grail Angel. Coming soon, I hope. The Spiritual Science of the Holy Blood and the Holy Grail is studied, developed out of the work of Rudolf Steiner and the underground streams of esoteric Christianity, which flowed from the Brotherhood of the Holy Grail to the Order of the Knights Templar and the true Rosicrucian Order, with a forward by my buddy Douglas Gabriel of... Uh, American Intelligence Media with his wife, Tyla, the totally industrious Tyla. I finally got my second book back on uh, eBay. So our can of light on the path. You, you can, there's a link below, or you can just go to uh, eBay and put in the title and it'll bring up uh, Mr. Smuggler, which is my brother's uh, presence <laughs> there. This has a forward by the noted astrosopher and psychologist, William Bento. Uh, extensive diagrams pertaining to the cosmology of Rudolf Steiner. And so I, I hope it can help you keep all these pieces uh, in an orderly fashion, create your own personal mandala, because it has to do with being able to be in participation to this universe and, and acknowledging and having gratitude for the consciousness that that exists there, as uh, Robert Allen is saying, you know, the attitude of gratitude, you know, I was, reminds me of a story because I was with uh, Thomas Bunyakia, the spokesman of the Hopi elders, and we were comparing notes and, you know, and the Hopi agree, this is the fourth world, just like Rudolf Steiner teaches. And, uh, but I was talking afterwards and then he did a blessing for me with, uh, with uh, the corn, uh, it's like just corn powder and saying a, a protection prayer over it. And after it was over, the gentleman that was with him said, one time uh, that Thomas Bunyaki did that for him, and then he took some of the corn and he threw it in the river, and the river bubbled back in response. It's like the river bubbling in, in gratitude for receiving the blessed corn. And so hopefully we can bless our worlds with our considerations. And I want to thank Robert Allen and everybody else for showing up and, and some very special contributors to this project in process that uh, have been generous to me as PayPal. Uh, dot me forward slash John Barnwell 888. And uh, I got the link for Robert Allen's uh, PayPal thing. Although you have to, you should get your little uh, handle like I got here. You're you're not caught up with the technology, but that's I'm the way. Not. I, I am, you probably I'm don't even care. I'm a Luddite. It's <laughs> yeah, Luddites. I'm a thousand years behind. You know, I'm I'm surrounded by Luddites. You and Douglas. Yeah. And, he got so fed up doing uh, computers for the military back in the 70s that he, he hardly could stand dealing with them. But uh, anyway, so this is great. And I, and I want to thank you. And, and I want to especially thank uh, Tyla and Douglas, Gabriel and Vadim and Vivian. And, and uh, there's a whole cast of characters, but I don't have the list in front of me and we're running out of time, but you know that I thank you and I love you all and thank you for showing up.